Hi, I'm Dr. Sridhar Kalyana Sundaram, uh, consultant neonatologist, and uh, welcome to my channel. Uh, we have with us again uh, Dr. Arif Khan, who is a consultant pediatric neurologist. Uh, he has trained in uh, UK, in Nottingham and Manchester. He worked as a consultant uh, pediatric uh, neurologist at uh, Leicester in UK. He has moved to Dubai for a few years now and he's very well established. He runs his own center uh, uh, called Neuropedia, which is a complete neuroscience center. And uh, he also uh, covers the private hospitals in the form of King's College London in Dubai and uh, VNMC Royal in uh, Abu Dhabi. So uh, thank you, Dr. Arif. You work really hard and your team does a great job. Uh, thank you for sparing your time. Thank you, Dr. Sridhar, for this lovely opportunity and great initiative. So, uh, I mean, in this session, I would like to cover a few important uh, concerns that the parents have regarding habits, some um, abnormal movements that the child may have and uh, things like that. I mean, it's more of a behavioral concern, but uh, because it's for parents, I think it would help. So we will start with uh, something which is very common called thumb sucking. So, I mean, uh, if a parent comes to you because it's persisting thumb sucking, how would you take that and what advice would you give them to prevent it in the first place or at what stage should they start intervening? Yeah. Um, I, you know, uh, although I'm not a behavioral consultant, I get a lot of these children because it's a pretty common and a straightforward uh, issue and that, that we see in lots of children. And parents come to you specifically saying, you know, my child is three years of age or five years of age and it's still thumb sucking at a particular age. So the first and the most important bit is to explain to parents why your child is doing it. And we do understand that this is not a pathological movement disorder or something like that. It, it, it is more of a, uh, it's almost like a soothing behavior. This is something that the child gains pleasure, physical pleasure from. And if you, if you tell a child not to do it, then it will get reinforced even more. And up to three years, when we see an, you know, an 18 month old or a two year old thumb sucking, I think it is fine, it's acceptable and you move on. But by the time a child is three years, three and a half, four years, you have to do something about it. Now, many parents come and say, do we have to do something about it because uh, it's a social stigma? No, no, not because of that, because it actually can cause physical harm to your child. Now, they say what? And, Usually thumb sucking can lead to splaying of the teeth, even the permanent teeth later on. It can lead to change in the jawline of a child. It can lead to uh, poor development of the tongue muscles. And it can lead to speech issues in the child, which sometimes are irreversible. So if your child is three and above and still has significant um, time that he gives to thumb sucking, whether it's sleeping continuously with the thumb in the mouth or doing it during the day, you have to seek help. As to at least get an opinion of what needs to be done. You should try and stop this from happening. And there are many ways to do that. Um, the first and the foremost is just talk to your child. If a child is four or five, they understand. You talk to them and explain to them that, you know, there is a problem with the germs going in your mouth. Your teeth might get splayed. You, children might tease you at school. And they give up by themselves they, because they have their own mind. If it doesn't work, you can show them some uh, YouTube videos where they're very well made to explain to children what are the downsides of doing it? And then there are some practical advices that are there, like um, you cover the thumb with a glove or the hand with a glove when the child sleeps. You tend, you try to identify which times of the day your child thumbs up and try to protect the thumb during that period. Uh, some people use a bad, bad tasting um, application or a paint to the thumb so that the moment the child puts it in the mouth, he gets averted to it. And there is this new phenomenon where uh, it really works. Many parents, uh, parents have come back and told me is they, they put something on the elbow, like a, uh, a padding over here. So the moment the child goes to flex it, the thumb doesn't go in the mouth and he gives up. So that's the one that many people have used and it's worked. So there are many practical phenomena to stop it. But ideally, if your child is three and above, still thumb sucking, seek help. And would you ask about any support before that? I mean, one and after two years, uh, do we intervene early? Does it help? Or? Not so much. It's a soothing behavior. It'll be difficult to uh, bring the child on board to do any of these things because that understanding is not there. Okay. Um, the best thing is uh, at that age, all you can do is maybe use stockings or something like that at times when a child comes up, like in the middle of the night, use it, but nothing more than that. That's good. And uh, I mean, the other thing is head banging and uh, temper tantrums. And I know we are not going to cover discipline here, but uh, just as a neurologist, uh, I mean, breath-holding spell, for example. So how would you approach that? Just a brief... Uh... 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that's one of the most scariest form of uh, uh, problem that we see and which is very common. And people tend to relate. That. Yes, it is. It is one of the, yeah, the mimics of seizures, as we say. So breath holding spell is pretty common, especially in children between 18 months to six years of age. And uh, you can sometimes see it before 18 months as well, but it's usually around that age when you see. Um, and it usually happens when your child has had an episode of fright or minor accident or a head bump somewhere or is suddenly frustrated, a toy being taken off, something that emotionally hurts or physically hurts the child. And the problem is when the child does it, the child can go into a blue spell or a pallid or pale spell. Now that is more on the medical side, but if your child starts crying and holds the breath in expiration and suddenly stops breathing, goes blue around the mouth and becomes limp and unconscious, that's a typical breath holding spell. And the one thing I would like to tell parents here is the first uh, action that you take, any one of us is go and take your child up and vertically hold your child and sometimes even shake them. Please don't do that. The best thing to do when your child has a breath holding spell is not to do anything. And that's the most difficult thing to do. So what I tell them, if your child has it, just make sure your child is turned to the side, the left or right, doesn't matter. And let the episode finish. Nothing you do will stop it. If it happens once a week, once a month, once in six months, it's okay. It's pretty common. As a child grows up, it will go away. If it's only happening very frequently, like multiple times a day, that's when you need to seek medical help. And the one thing that I always tell even GPs and pediatricians to do is check their uh, hemoglobin and iron level. Because if they have iron deficiency, if you correct it, you can reduce the episodes uh, significantly. But it is not a medical emergency. Don't worry about it. Thank you. And um, you have a female baby or even a male baby sometimes uh, getting pleasure when they move their uh, thighs together or rub their bottom. I mean, sexual gratification like phenomenon. I mean, it's not uncommon, but uh, I mean, how would you describe it to the family? That's the key. So the problem here is not uh, the family so much because they come to you seeking an answer or explanation of why my child is doing it. The, the onus is on this physician as how do you explain that to parents, that your child is doing it for a pleasure. So you have to be very sensitive here. So why this child does it, like crossing the legs and straining or stiffening up or putting something between the legs like a seat belt or a high chair, for example, and pressing the legs together. Now they don't do, do it for a sexual pleasure. They do it mainly for a physical pleasure. And when they get physical pleasure and when you take them out of it, they will be upset and they will cry. For this particular habit, you don't have to do anything. They all grow out of it, basically. You don't need any investigations, no EEGs or, you know, the advanced technological advanced investigation, nothing. They all grow out of it. Yeah. And self-gratification is the right word, by the way, Sridhar. <laughs> so, yeah. Ticks are also a common problem we face. And um, what would you uh, suggest to, to parents when they come with a problem like that? I mean, um, ticks, whether they are, they come in different forms and they are this brief, uh, very stereotypical, repetitive movements that we see happen in children. And you would see that they'll have this burst of ticks happening for a short period of time, like maybe a few weeks, and then it'll go away and then you come back again in different forms. So this is what we call as typical waxing and waning uh, method of what ticks follow. So simple motor ticks are very common. They're very transient. They might last for a few months maybe maximum up to a year, and they go away. So simple motor takes in 95, 96% of children, it goes away and doesn't come back, doesn't affect the child at all, and don't need treatment. Yes, in some children, those ticks may go on to become chronic ticks, or the dreaded Tourette syndrome that we call, where children have uh, vocal ticks as well as motor ticks. But that's, we're talking about one to 2% of children. Uh, so a very minority. So we have to give reassurance to parents first that yes, a child has simple motor tics, but it's a phenomena that we see in at least one in every four to one in every five child that comes to us. That's pretty common. And it's only one in a hundred that eventually go on to have something more chronic. And usually boys are affected more than girls in this, but it's about three to one ratio. And although we don't know the exact me mechanism of how this happens, we know that these go away. So bringing parents into confidence and reassuring them is the key. Now, if you ask me, out of the 10 children with ticks that come to my clinic, 
nine of them I don't treat. I just reassure them. I ask parents to completely ignore them. And this is the phrase I use. I say, we need to make sure that your child's mind forgets that he or she has ticks. And the moment you ask him or her, have you done it? Is it happening? Why are you doing it? You're reinforcing the, this or stamping it on their brain even more. So the moment you forget it, you ignore it, you're making their mind forget it itself. And they will not have it anymore. So ignore it fully. That's the key initially. Yes, in a small percentage, if that affects their social life, their academic work, they're being bullied by people, their self-confidence, yes, then we do give them some form of, uh, we make some form of intervention. It could be our psychologist doing some traversal techniques or cognitive behavioral therapy with them. And we as neurologists using some uh, medications or pharmacotherapy to improve these symptoms. But we are not altering the eventual outcome. What we're doing is suppressing the symptoms so that it doesn't come in their way of building their confidence and working at, and uh, going to school regularly. Thank you. I mean, that was great. And uh, I'm sure uh, this would be a very useful session. There are many more questions, but unfortunately, I mean, we have to wind it up. And it was an excellent session. Thank you so much for your uh, support and for being here. And in terms of the listeners and viewers, if you have any comments for Dr. Arif, please mention it in the comment section. And uh, we hopefully will have him later on for another useful session like this. And do share it and uh, do encourage your friends and colleagues to subscribe as well. Thank you, uh, Dr. Arif, for coming.